uh, yeah, just to start with, can you just give us a little brief overview of where you're based, um, what your facilities and kind of like how your groups um, kind of made up? Oh, how it made up? Oh, a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay. more like um, postdocs, uh, students, um, kind of like that. Oh, okay, okay. So um, I'm the director of LabTAO, which is a um, um, government uh, laboratory based in Lyon. Uh, it's INSERM, which is National um, Institute for Health, and also it's working with the University of Lyon. So we are about 70 persons uh, working in the, in the group um, with various backgrounds, um, mechanical engineering, biomedical engineering, uh, but also many doctors in different specialties, uh, radiology, urology, surgery, uh, um, cardiology, I mean, many different specialties. Uh, as we work with the university and we have professors in our staff, we can uh, recruit some PhD students. And currently we have uh, about 15 uh, PhD students uh, doing the, the, the research in, in, in the lab. Um, our global interest is therapeutic ultrasound. Uh, we have been in this field for about 40 years now because the, the lab was founded in uh, 85. And um, our um, objective is really always to go for industrial and clinical translations. So this is why we, uh, we have uh, different companies um, um, working around, around the lab. And the most famous one is probably EDAP. Uh, for what they've done on prostate cancer. Um, we have also, besides therapeutic ultrasound, we have also a strong interest in uh, elastography um, for diagnosis or for treatment monitoring. And um, uh, what else? So there, there is no really um, uh, particular focus uh, in therapeutic ultrasound sound because we are interested in surgery but also uh, uh, application of low energy ultrasound or drug delivery i mean we have a very broad spectrum uh, of projects uh, uh, in the lab yeah and you have it sounds like you have quite a big group so you are able to kind of branch over many different areas um so yeah thanks for talking to us through that what how are you connected with thunder um, well, because of the thematics first, <laughs> so there is, a, is a network of laboratories working on therapeutic ultrasound and uh, there is a very strong uh, uh, community in UK and I thought it was uh, interesting for my lab to be uh, part of this network and uh, I got connected to the, this network uh, on uh, Gail's Terra invitation, so I attended um, some of the meetings of the, of the center. Okay, that's great. So you already mentioned that um, your team covers quite a lot of different disciplines and they're from a variety of backgrounds and that you also have doctors. So um, do you have uh, a lot of, in some of your projects, is there quite a few people from different backgrounds working together, including the clinicians as well? And how does that um, kind of work? Um. It's very valuable. I mean, you, you have some uh, very experienced um, medical doctors, uh, which can, for example, supervise uh, students working on technical topics. Um, we can have also younger clinicians uh, doing their PhD in the, in, in the lab, so learning a bit more on the technology. So that's also interesting. And what we like in the future that they stay in the in the in the field and still collaborate with the lab and is, for example i can mention uh, francis bessier who is a young cardiologist running his own program now mm -hmm. um, and uh, also the the the, 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 the clinicians uh, can run their clinical study um, in the context of the lab so there is a very big program on uh, prostate uh, cancer and which is run by uh, one of the, of the professor in the world, G, uh, Sebastian Cousé. So this is a different way we can uh, integrate clinical uh, research in, in, our, in our activity. And do you find it almost accelerates some projects having clinicians there because they can give 
their opinions on what may or may not work in the clinic, but then also have access to uh, the uh, clinic as well. Definitely, it accelerates. Uh, but uh, even earlier than that, it um, helps us in the, the definition of our objective, because, you know, sometimes as an engineer, we can uh, decide to work on some crazy ID, which have no chance to go to go in clinics forever. So having the, yeah. the opinion of a clinicians uh, early uh, uh, in the in the in, in development of the project is very important. So this is something we always try to do. Doesn't mean that we succeed in bringing everything in clinics, but at, at least it helps. Yeah, that is a great advantage of have, having a multidisciplinary team. So you mentioned that you have quite a lot of projects across um, different areas of therapeutic ultrasound. Where do you think the greatest potential lies for the future of therapeutic ultrasound? Um, there is a very strong interest in our community in uh, neural modulation, uh, use of ultrasound for modulating the uh, neural activity. And uh, I put to engine one of the, of the PI in my lab, um, started a program a few years ago on that. And um, it has been very successful in getting funding now. So you can see that there is a growing interest in our community. So well, obviously there is no uh, application yet in clinic because we are still at the stage where we must be, know a bit more in the um, mechanism of action of ultrasound on the nerves. But uh, yes, that's, that's a very promising field, I think, for uh, for therapeutic ultrasound. And uh, the second one I'd like to mention is um, probably a combination of um, um, well, the, the high food with the, uh, with different drugs, like for drug delivery. And um, well, you know, immunotherapy is uh, is a very uh, also um, uh, active field in uh, in oncology. And uh, I believe ultrasound can help there. And um, that is also something we, we, we'd like to, to move on as well. That sounds exciting. Um, just to finish up, have you had, I mean, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this, but have you had any major delays in your research because of COVID and how have you managed to overcome these and are handling them now? Yeah, obviously um, the, the COVID was, uh, uh, very problematic for performing some experiments, particularly the uh, animal experiments, because every uh, animal facilities were were closed. So um, what we did, I mean, we we tried to um, facilitate the life of our students in particular, so they could uh, come to the lab whenever they 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 needed uh, for performing their experiments, and then after we uh, prioritized their experiments. Uh, as soon as the uh, animal facilities were reopened. So this delayed for some of them their, their defense. So mm. we have like maybe six months delay, um, but um, at least they will be able to defend their, their thesis in really good conditions. So uh, we try to not close the lab, but uh, we, as much as we could, um, we um, allow the people to come to the lab for performing the experiments and work from home for like reporting and writing papers and everything. So, well, we did our best. <laughs> We've been yeah. through it, I hope. Um, and, and, and we'll see um, uh, what the, the students will, uh, will defend this for. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great that you didn't have to close the lab because I know um, at the ICR, we, we completely shut down for some time. Yeah. There was a period where, where it was completely shut down and we tried to maintain the link with the with the people mm. but uh, as soon as we could we we allowed the people to come back for in the lab for performing the experiments and for for last last spring for example uh and it worked pretty well like like, like this but, uh, that's yeah that's good to hear that you're um you kind of managed to work around it and um had to. Do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, uh, we'll leave it there. Thanks so much for um, chatting uh, to me today.